afternoon, everybody. The Constitution of the United States of America says, in part, Congress shall have the power to promote science and useful arts, uh, let's see, by uh, securing for, uh, for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and inventions. That with the, the clause which allows Congress to regulate Congress or, or, or commerce among the several states to create a system of intellectual property law, which includes trademark, copyright, trade secrets, and patents. The patent system allows uh, Congress uh, and, and its agents to grant to inventors monopolies on their inventions in exchange for um, submitting those inventions to the public, giving up their secrets. And that has been hugely beneficial to this country. We are one of the most innovative countries in the history of the uni known universe, in small part because of this patent system. Unfortunately, it has not aged well. The system has been working for about 200 years and was established before the ascendance of corporations, before the invention of software, and certainly before the invention of open source. And the patent system is incompatible with, with open source and is problematic. So there are a number of ideas for what to do about that. Mine is that we should simply abolish the patent system, that it has long outlived its usefulness. We just don't need it anymore. We're plenty good at innovating on our own. We don't need the government to, to do that for us. Our speaker today is going to give a more moderate, more reasonable alternative to that. Uh, this is Carl Hewitt. Uh, Carl Hewitt is a professor emeritus from MIT in computer science. He um, is best known, perhaps, for having discovered actors, the actor model of computation. Uh, actors were responsible, the actor theory was responsible for the development of the scheme programming language and functions as first-class objects with closure, the best idea in the history of programming languages. You don't get any royalties on that, do you? I don't. I, I should have patented it. <laughs> Great stuff, anyway. I, I, I think actors may have the solution to a lot of our problems, um, including performance, uh, security, and perhaps other weird things. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker for today, Carl Hewitt. Thank you very much. That's uh, quite a recommendation from uh, Croc, who's uh, done some very good things with uh, with the ECMAScript X, X committee and uh, JavaScript, the good parts. <laughs> so I, I'm very honored to be introduced by him. So yes, I'm going to go into this question is, is software unpatentable? And just to preview, the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> And I'll talk about the, uh, the, the, uh, the science and the engineering, the technology, the politics, and the economics of this particular little conundrum. And you can find me. I'm listed here. I've got I sometimes uh, tweet on Twitter. And I have a website that's listed here. And if you're interested in the slides for this talk, you can find them at unpatentable.carlhewitt.info. And there's some acknowledgments at the end. So, let us take a look at the current situation. Let's look at the news. Uh, here's an interesting article that appeared in the New York Times, the patent used as a sword. It tells the story of a small software company, right, that had some innovative speech technology and was starting to gain some traction when Big Boy came along. And Big Boy says to the small company, you gotta sell yourself to us or you'll sue us because you're violating our patents. The little company says, no, we'd rather remain independent. So sure enough, Big Co sues them, pulls out by patents, sues them. Little Co spends $5 million, and they win. Patents ruled invalid. The day after the ruling comes down, Big Co says, oh, that's interesting. Here are five more patents, and sues them again. <laughs> Little Co says, we only had $5 million. <laughs> so what they do is they countersue Big Co for unfair competition just in order to try to get a little bit better price 
in which to sell out. And they did indeed sell out. And then there's another article from Tech Dirt, Startups Realizing that Patent Trolls are an Existential Threat. And the patent trolls aren't just content with suing little companies now. Now they're offering, after going after them from DMCA. And then there's a very nice article by a colleague of mine at Santa Clara, Patent Trolls by the Numbers, that explains some of what's going on. And the numbers are quite fierce. A very interesting article on Tom's Hardware. Apple and Google spent more, spent more, both spent more on patents than R&D. Is that ridiculous or what? Obtaining and defending patents. So for Google, it was, it was, it was, they, they accounted for the acquisition of the patents in the Motorola thing. Okay. So here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about a proposed criteria for the demarcation of software unpatentability, and then end with a call uh, to action of a campaign to abolish software patentability. Because basically, we're faced with a quagmire. Like Vietnam. Things about, about quagmires, they, they seem like they're big and impregnable. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't I was, I was a graduate student. It wasn't obvious to us that we could do anything about Vietnam, right? We kind of seemed kind of hopeless and helpless. We hoped somebody else would do something. But, you know, through a tremendous amount of political action and force, uh, we did indeed, although it streamed, it rather extremed at the time, we did indeed withdraw from Vietnam. The cost was high, but the deed was done. So, um, there's a hypothesis. There's some, there's some halfway measures being proposed. A good friend and colleague, a colleague and good friend of mine, Mark Lemley, has proposed that software patentability is okay if the computational processes are specified precisely, right? What he says is, these guys, they're, they're claiming the goal. They're not actually, uh, actually explaining how. And I think that Mark is wrong, and I'll try to explain why. The reason is the technology has moved on since the days of square root and sort. <laughs> and we now have highly precise operational constructs in which computers on their own set goals, have strategies for achieving and assessing goals, deal in conjectures and metaphors and analogies, have high level Contin executable contingency plans, deal in argumentation. Uh, just to make that a little bit more precise, here is a little bit of code. Just love code right on a slide. Setting a goal. We set the goal to do a differential diagnosis between weight loss and weakness, okay? And then we have a strategy for achieving that goal. When our goal is to achieve a diagnosis of symptom one and symptom two using a differential, then set a sub-goal to find some morbidity that's associated with both symptoms, then set another goal to show that this morbidity is a common cause of both symptoms, and then you've achieved your goal. So this is pretty high-level stuff, right? You patent this stuff, good. <laughs> or an analogy. Well, tell the machine about analogy. Let's say a solar system is analogous to an atom with a solar system sun analogous to the nucleus of the atom, and the solar system planet is analogous to an electron of an atom, okay? Well, gee, <laughs> that's pretty high-level stuff. Now, all of this high-level machine thinking is reducible, we've discovered in computer science. It's reducible to message sending, message receiving, message receiver creation, message processing, including how to process future messages. See, that early work I did on the actor model wasn't wasted. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll return to this point later in the talk, okay, but this is going to be critical. So how do we know? How do we know? How do we know? How do we know? Well, computer scientists may say so, but you might want to go and look into it yourself. I recommend a very nice video that I did with Eric Major and Sibirsky. It's available on Microsoft Channel 9. 
And there's a paper that I wrote called What is Computational that's available in a computable, computable in universe if you've got a couple hundred dollars to spare. Or you can just go to my website. <laughs> and there's Proceedings of Inconsistency Robustness 2011. There's its website. There's a scientific conference that covered this kind of stuff. So that's why you know, we put a stake in the ground and say, hey, look, all of computation is reducible to this stuff. Okay. Well, if operational imprecision is not the nature of the quagmire, what is? I claim the nature of the quagmire has, consists of advanced technology and new applications. And by advanced technology, I mean those things like those advanced programming language constructs where you dealt in goals, plans for achieving goals, working with analogies. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'd like to do a little preview into the technology future because if you're dealing with a quagmire, you want to know where the science is going. So if it's going to shift from underneath you, how that might affect what you're going to do. So we're going to take a little diversion here into my prognosis as to what the technology is going to co coming up. And I'll show how that's not going to save us, save the, the software patentability. In fact, it's going to make it worse. Okay. So there are the perils of probability. We have this fundamental contradiction. The probability of present moment is approximately zero because we live in a very unlikely state, right? Suppose that you flip a whole bunch of coins and there's a certain sequence of heads and tails. That particular sequence of heads and tails is very unlikely, right? But that's what's happened, okay? So we have these two ways of calculating probability that are fundamentally inconsistent. And philosophers would say, oh, these computer scientists, okay, they know nothing. We sophisticated guys who know about our a prioris and our a posterioris, okay. This doesn't bother us because we have an explanation or at least a vocabulary for sweeping it under the rug. But nevertheless, it's a fundamental problem. And it's not easily fixed because there's lots of indeterminacy in this world. Much of it is inherent. And also to do these probability calculations at all, you have to make these very strong independent assumptions which are often wrong in validating the calculations. So we have to distinguish between correlation and causality. For example, weather prediction is run on correlation engines. We can predict what the weather is going to be like in the next few days just by correlating similar weather conditions that have happened in the past. And then we can even come up with a probability. Right? The, the genius weatherman says, 40% chance it'll rain tomorrow. What does this mean? Does he know whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not? Absolutely not. <laughs> he just knows that in conditions like this, 40% of the time in the past, it's rained the next day. Then there's climate modeling. Now, climate modeling is a different kettle of fish, right? Climate modeling involves all these hydrodynamic equations, right, and all these historical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a huge amount of theory involved in that, right? And for that, probability makes no sense, right? Say, what is the probability that Joe's climate model, let's say the one from the university, what is the probability that the, primate, that the climate model from the University of Pennsylvania is correct, right? 60%? Does it mean that 60% of the models like that <laughs> in the world? are better than theirs or worse than theirs. It just it makes no sense. Okay, the probabilities just don't carry us far enough. Okay. So what you do is it means you have to move beyond data to information, beyond the, what the, the, what's currently happening now in advertising and in search is they're using signals extracted from data and they do correlation on them. And we're going to have to move beyond that to reasoning about uh, inconsistent information. And it turns out this depends on it strong on a technology called Minicore, which I won't why, and it's required for, ed for applications like medicine and health. And if you're interested in this, I gave a talk at Stanford last June, and the slides are online, and you can go take a look at that. So <clears throat> we have to move beyond this correlation stimulus response 
era that we're in. Right? It's good as far as it goes. It just goes far enough. And even the founders of Google said they were going to organize all the world's information. They didn't say they were going to organize all the world's data. <laughs> so this is where we're going. And moving further on, we're, we're looking at machine invention of these uh, theories and models. And so that'll lead us to a place. Oh, and just, to, just to make sure, right, that we understand this. The data is still relevant, right? Because even with our high-level plan that we had before, uh, we need to know things like, how often is there a morbidity that is associated with those symptoms? For that, you have to go look at the, at the data. How are there information, which is derived from the data? How often is this morbidity a common cause of the symptoms, right? So we're going to need a new kind of engineer, the two-hatted kind that knows both about the information and the data. OK, so we're looking at then moving further on into machine invention, basically computer-created patentable software, which is not obvious, original, and the computer will write the patent claims. <laughs> so this has been our little diversion. This has been our peek into the future and to see whether the future was going to ha help out the patent system or make it even more miserable? OK, and the answer is more misery. But let's, yes? Question? Uh, that's turns, that turns out to be much harder. Technically, much more difficult to verify. The so, so, so the patent office, so in words, basically, the, 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 the patent writers are going to mechanize before the patent office can. And we're coming to that in just a second. But, that might be science fiction, right? That, those are just one guy's projections about the future. Maybe the nightmare won't come true. So let's look at the current boots on the ground, right? Where de Gaulle said something that's relevant. I predict you will sink step by step into a bottomless quagmire, however much you spend in men and money. This was good advice. Did we take it? No. This is what Charles de Gaulle told JFK. <laughs> so I think this is where we're going with a patent system. And here's how. We have a business method. OK? Here's my business method. The customer pays only $50 for our app, which helps automate the creation of a provisional application for the customer app. And then it automatically files this application with the USPTO as a micro entity. And you can make money doing this. The customer pays only $200 more for our enhanced app, which helps automate the transformation of provisional to utility patent. And we offer consulting at an extra charge. The customer now can use our extended app to market their patent to the trolls. We take a commission on sales. And then the happy customer collects royalties from the trolls. If we can just get a 1% market share, <laughs> that's 10,000 patents. We get rich, and you get a patent tsunami, and the patent office dies. Because patenting the heuristic knowledge of every intellectual field stands to overwhelm the patent examiners, and the courts. And we're just getting started. Because 25% of all US patents this year will be mobile-related, software-oriented. And we're not even counting the other software patents. So do we have something that's growing here or not? So what we're looking at is an arms race. Okay with the software developers looking at troll licensing, their own patents to the trolls, external patents from the trolls. We're looking at troll litigation plus thermonuclear war. We're looking at the patent office having a tsunami of patent applications. And it's only $37.50 for a micro-entity provisional patent. And the courts are looking at a tsunami of troll litigation and thermonuclear war. And we're just getting started. <laughs> I mean, this, this, this little app 
little uh, Apple versus Samsung truffle here in San Jose. That's just the start. So what about an arms race? Who makes money in an arms race? <laughs> in this particular arms race, it's trolls and their lawyers who make money. No, they aren't. You, no, you have, to, you have to, to file a lawsuit. You could. No, you could file a lawsuit on the basis of your provisional. But usually the provisional is something you use with an investor so that you have some claim to back up the teeth of your non-disclosure agreement or you use it with another company. So it's, 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 it's typically used for uh, in trade secret litigation. You have to convert it to a patent, too. Oh, yes, there is. Absolutely. And now that, that's going to get worse. Yep. So propose a way forward. Claim is that machine thinking and computational processes are fundamentally the same kind of thing. And we need a bright red line to distinguish machine thinking and computational processes from everything else. OK, well, now we come back to that previous slide where we claim we've got it. <laughs> The machine, message sending, message receiving, message receiving creation, message processing, okay? And I now I'm going to go more deeply into what that means. So here we have it. Uh, this is, I, that's a duplicate slide. I just should have taken that out, okay? So we have this advanced technology with machine thinking becoming so close to human thinking that there's no principled way to tell, to, to say the difference in kind. This is not to say that artificial intelligence is here. The humans are still better at it. It's just that we can't distinguish the kind of stuff, the human thinking, from the computation. So this makes our proposed demarcation. We have pro computational processes over here in the yellow. And we then have the allowable patent claims. And we have the bright red line in between. And now we have to show that this bright line makes sense that it's something that can be understood by patent examiners, and it's something that can be enforced by the courts. So let's look at the application, OK? So we have a process and method here, which I'd like to license to the patent office. The process and method is, for each patent claim, remove every element that consists of any of message sending, message receiving, message re receiver creation, or message processing, right? And here's an example of a patent that crosses the line. The IBM Watson Jeopardy patent claims. They have a patent claim about submitting a set of questions. And I say, that's message sending. They have in their patent claim, there's a quote, receiving back a set of answers. I claim that's message receiving. They have comparing the set of answers received to the answers in. I claim that's message processing. So this is an example of how we're going to go about doing this. Here's another example, famous example, actually ruled on by the Supreme Court, called Fluke. And it was a method for updating alarm limits. The idea is you had some kind of a chemical process. You read the signals in. You do this tiny little bit of algebra, right? And then you set the alarm limit. OK. So you read the process variables. That's message receiving. The physical signaling mechanism can be patented but not the information, the meaning of the signals conveyed. Calculate the alarm limit. Well, that's message processing. The physical substrate, whatever you're using as a physical substrate, OK, that you can patent, but not the denotational computational process, the machine thinking induced. Set the alarm bell. Well, we're sending a message off to the alarm bell. OK, so let's look at that a little bit more diagrammatically. Here is our bright red line across the middle. We have the patentable stuff down below. We have the sensors and the wires and the transceivers, OK, for getting the stuff from the chemical process into our integrated circuit chip. Then we have the wires and the transceivers and the actuators for ringing the alarm bell. All patentable. What's not patentable is the meaning of the signals, the human meaning of the signals. What is also not patentable is the denotation of the chip. So how can we use this? 
The patent office could use this if they adopt this criterion of demarcation. They could use this in a way that's similar to the way that they do business method process, uh, patents. They impose additional requirements on business method patents. So if they had a way to distinguish software patents, they could also treat software patents differently. Question? Signals, right? Signals per se, the ones and the zeros. The meaning, that's right. So how would it affect the I don't think it does, but we, we'll, we'll go into that in the question and answer. Because our intent, unlike Doug's intent, our intent is to carve out just the software patents and have them deal, de, de, deemed unpatentable. We're not as ambitious as, as Croc. And, and not, okay. We're not trying to, de to, 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 to we're not trying to deal with the pharmaceutical patents. We're not even trying to address the gene patents, which have got problems of their own. Or we're not trying to in in, in, uh, do anything to Intel's hardware patents, right? We're just trying to call call out the software patents and say something the Supreme Court said before: human thinking is not patentable. And so, if this is that, then this isn't patentable either. Okay. So the line for SCOTUS, yes? Well, that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, with our criteria, right? So, so the unpatentable's up here. Here we have the meaning of the signals, the mathematical denotation, the, compu the computation, that mathematics, not patentable. Okay. So the whole, the line for, for SCOTUS is, say, hey, look, we have this technology change that mandates review. If there's no principled way to distinguish computation from human thinking due to advances in computer science, then. <laughs> OK. And we can actually compute these denotational meanings, meanings if you want to go into the details. of it. it's, it's, it's this limiting process of how a computation develops, right? A denotation of computation. And if you want to, you can go read up on the references of that stuff. But it's, it's abstract mathematics, and it's not very useful unless you want to do a little uh, model checking with the technical branch of computer science. OK. So the legal argument is that software per se is unpatentable for two reasons. There's no principled way to distinguish computation from human thinking. And the meaning is a mathematical denotation, and mathematics has also been deemed to be unpatentable. So here we have our call to action, okay. the Software Unpatentability Alliance. It's super. <laughs> Whose goal, sole aim in life is abolish software patentability. Okay. Not taking on any other issues. This is not a bunch of bomb throwers, unlike some of our colleagues, <laughs> who will remain nameless. <laughs> and in particular, for SUPA, SUPA is not calling for unilateral disarmament. It's saying, hey, look, you can be against war, and you don't have to disarm, right? So it's OK. It's within, you know, in terms of the stance of SUPA, it says, OK, you can have your patents. You can practice your patents, OK? And you can be uh, you can be suing other guys and defending your own lawsuits because you just unfortunately happen to be at war, right? As long as you're working, signing up to get rid of this thing, you know. It says you know, you, as long as you, you know, if, if 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 you're a platoon in Vietnam, right? You're, you're still in Vietnam. You don't lay down your arms and say, "Shoot me." <laughs> you may have to fight your way out, <laughs> but the idea is to get out. <laughs> So, so that's the idea of, of, of SUPA. And here are the intended allies. They're the technology companies, OK? Well, if you're paying more for patents than R&D, what business are you in? <laughs> and if there's a swarm of mosquitoes that is, that is, that is eating up your management time, right? Because uh, if we're going to play this game, People are going to play it. 
If you're, if, if you're a small technology company, you're looking at financial crippling extortion. That's all there is to it. It's an existential threat. If you're an investor, now you start worrying about the financial viability of software startups, right? You know, war? Did we sign up for this? I don't know. And research labs. Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is wonderful at Stanford. Now what do we have to worry about? Our research lab. Some troll, we're doing some, you know, some student doing this PhD, right? Well, unfortunately, a troll appears and troll says, you're practicing our patent. <laughs> he ain't allowed to do that. <laughs> says, we're not making money. Then we don't care. We got an absolute monopoly on this thing. Read the law. Stop. Mm. And then the educational institutions. We're starting to move a lot of software technology. We want to move software technology into the education process, right? Well, here comes the troll. <laughs> says, no, you can't teach like that. I've got a patent on it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just awful. And then public interest groups. Uh, I've been talking to some of the public interest groups to get to see if I can get them to sign up. So far, I don't know why they don't just jump right in, but they haven't yet. But I'm, I'm working on them. We'll see. All the usual names apply. <laughs> we, I won't name any names. And thought leaders. So we think there's a natural alliance here. And the only guys we're leaving out are the trolls and their lawyers. <laughs> Of course, the trolls and the lawyers are making billions of dollars right now, so you think they're going to take this line down? Probably not. Okay, so that's SUPA. And uh, two weeks from now, we're going to have a uh, panel discussion, bring the, the people together. Uh, Colleen Chen from Santa Clara University. She's the one who did the study. She actually went out and, and talked to the... Uh, to the patent officers and the big companies and the small companies and collected a whole bunch of numbers. I highly recommend her paper, which I referenced early in my talk, and we can go back to the reference. But uh, Colleen Chen uh, has published a very nice paper. She's going to be on the panel. I'm going to be on the panel. Robert Merges, who's, a, who's, who's our pro-patent man, right? We're on a balanced pat panel. He's our pro-patent man, from more, more, more pro-patent from UC Berkeley. Tim Porter, who's a senior patent counsel at Google. And Pam Samuelson of UC Berkeley, who's a really, really good uh, copyright person. And I recommend, strongly recommend her current article on copyright in the current issue of the, CA, of the CACM. Now, unfortunately, two days ago, Pam had an accident and broke her leg. So she's having surgery today. And so we have persuaded her, in the interests of her future good health and our peace of mind, to bow out of our patent, <laughs> out of our panel, right? Bow, bow out of our panel. So we will miss Pan. Pan is a really, really good person, and we'll bring her back for a subsequent event because we suspect <clears throat> that we're not going to win instantly. <laughs> that they're not, the, 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 the trolls and their patent lawyers are not going to say, oh, Carl, you've got a great idea. Why don't we just all go around and commit supuki? <laughs> don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Okay, so that is the basics of my talk. Now, I have some more slides on the nature of copyright and how copyright is different from patents. But rather than confuse things all at once, what I thought I'd do is I'd open it up for question, questions just on the patent part of it. But my question was, I completely am on agreement on like the, uh, the research it inhibits the patents and like at educational institutes, small companies and so on. But how would you address the argument of any companies that why would we invest so much money in R&D if we can't re re reap the benefits in the future? Right. That, that, that's a very good question. And uh, there's a hypothesis that patents uh, in, in encourage innovation. The empirical and historical evidence is decisively against that that historians of science and economics have included that patents have inhibited innovation all the way going back to the steam engine more than they have increased innovation. But nevertheless, you know, being of modest goals, we're not going to go after all the patents, just the software ones. And the software ones, it's really dubious, really dubious that patents have added anything. The way that we currently gain our protection uh, is is through is is pretty much through copyright, and what copyright does is it prohibits the blatant ripoff. 
And this has worked well in other areas of media. It works for novels, it works in advertising, it works, it works in all sorts of, 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 of endeavors, right? And I can go through the process, and I will in, in, in about five minutes, the process of copyright and how copyright protects us against the blatant ripoff. And then, you know, be fleet of foot, because what's happening now with the patent system, sad to relate, is that there are a couple of big companies that have not been able to compete in the marketplace, and they think that if they can take maybe $5, $10 per device from somebody like HTC, slow them down, hobble them, maybe they can compete on that basis. And do we want that going on? I don't know. <laughs> Two quick, one, one quick thing, if you can comment on non-practicing entity decisions that have happened recently. Um, non-practicing non -practicing oh, entity yeah, decisions trolls. from the courts against the trolls. Yeah. But on, on, a, on a broader, probably more confounding question we'll be dealing with before too long, the whole thing of, of, of 3D printers printing objects which somebody claims they have the right to that object, but the description of the object in the code is you know, what's owned, who has the they can, Where does they all can, that they go? They can copyright it. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> is, you copyright the object. You, you, you copy, copy, copyright the object. If you have some functionality, mm. physical functionality, you can try to patent that. But then the originality is in the physical functionality. It doesn't make any difference whether you call, whether you, whether you carved it, you know, using your, your your chisel or a machine made the thing. It doesn't matter. So are, are the courts starting to wake up? And, and, and see these non-practicing entities as, as detrimental and finding against well, them more? Well, they're worried. Yeah. Okay. But the, I think the thing that, that, that worries them most as they learn more about it, I've been talking to the guys in the patent office, is the tsunami. <laughs> I mean, that's just not going to work. Even the patent office. I mean, it's true that they get a, a fair amount of revenue from it, okay? Only but just... if they're going to become a dysfunctional entity because of the patent tsunami, okay, they're thinking... You know, maybe we'll just cut this one loose, right? We'll just forget about these software patents because mm -hmm. it has, the danger is it will do us what Kroc proposes and take down the whole patent system. Well, won't it just clog up the pipeline so much that, in fact, the trolls will, will starve for how to have enough patents to go run out and run and enforce? Unfortunately, they already have sufficient number of bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the combination of the new ones where everybody else sees this trough, right? You know, if you only get a one, you know, there are a million apps out there, right? You get a 1% market share. That's 10,000 patents. Do you know what that does to the patent system? 10,000 patents? Ah. Oh. <laughs> so, so I'm not entirely convinced that your bright shining line here is so easily demarcated simply because what you seem to be saying is that the, the semantics and the syntax can't really be, be patented, right? The, the denotation and the, uh, the meaning of the, the things. The denotation and the meaning, that's mathematics, cannot be patented. And, but the things that can be patented are essentially hardware, right? The, the right. wires Physical and devices. the sensors and so forth. But is there really a clear distinction about those as an architect? We know that there's things that we want to do in hardware, things that we want to do in software. There's no functional difference between these two things in the, in the sense that anything I can do in, in hardware, I could conceivably do in, in software and vice versa. How, how do you draw that line in a way that's really convincing? Yeah, that's the interesting thing. The place to draw the line is at the patent claims. While in theory, you could do all this software stuff in hardware, okay. Once I make you specify it in hardware, and you only get the hardware patent for that device and those signals, it turns out it's very easy to work around whatever you're doing. And as a practical matter, okay, you cannot, you know, make claims for that hardware without making appeal to the mathematical abstractions. So the, the, the place where to catch them is at the claims. And that's why, you know, that's why the, the work that I've done here is attacking the claims. Thank you. Uh, this is very interesting. So I may be missing something, but if one of the arguments here is that the compute computation is indistinguishable from human thought, uh, and therefore we should pull it into the non-patentable space, I'm guessing you're not a big fan of business uh, method patents in the first place, but how would I just, is there a bright line between those areas where we currently are issuing business method patents and software patents? Because to me, it seems like an arrangement that's a, that's of people a, a thinking of good point, things right? to do. And I consider this to be kind of a, in part, a political campaign, right? And you don't want to try to take a bridge too far, but if it falls automatically, you have to gain the, the, this bridge. <laughs> 
I won't cry. <laughs> right. So I think that the patents are such a big problem for us, for the big companies, for the small companies, okay, that, uh, and the universities, right, that we have to do something about this. So let's see if we can do something about this, and then we'll let the next one, let's let the next bridge take care of itself. But that's a very good point. Thank you.